Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I am joined today by Scott Doonbeer. Today is April 2nd at the time of this recording, but who knows when you're watching this episode, hopefully on the day it drops. But folks, Scott Doonbeer is a pioneer and a dude who's responsible for so much stuff that you love and myself included. Uh, I am really concerned because you are, uh, you spearheaded the artist edition. You are the reason why the absolute edition exists. And also you were an editor at, on, on books like Gen 13 and Max Maximized. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to be talking about a lot. <laughs> Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. And I began at uh, Wildstorm on April 10th, 1995. And I was there until... March 31st, 2007, 2008. You worked directly with Alan Moore on uh, his... Uh, America's Best Comics, yeah. America's Best Comics label. And uh, as I understand it, you were responsible essentially for wrangling and uh, running interference for, for Alan Moore between him and DC Brass. Because, of course, when he set that up with you guys, there was no DC involvement. Yeah, I... I um, you know, I... I People use the word wrangler, but, you know, I was his editor and um, I, um, without any false modesty, I was responsible for him coming to, um, <laughs> coming to Wildstorm uh, back in uh, 1997. I was actually, um, it's kind of a funny story if you want to hear it. I would. Um, in 1997, I was in New York City. Um, I think it was in, I don't know, it was sometime in the first half of the year. I was in New York City with, um, on a gen, I'm sorry, a, a danger girl signing tour. <laughs> and um, it was me and... Uh, Jeff Campbell, J. Scott Campbell, and Alex Garner, and uh, I'm not sure. I think it was just the three of us. Yeah, but so we were uh, we were in New York. Uh, we were doing some some appearances at different shows, and you know we went up to D.C. and we we're hanging out at D.C. a little bit, and then later on that night, I got a phone call from Brandon Peterson, and. Um, he or actually an email from Brandon Peterson and he asked me if he had if I had any work for him and it was late at night it was probably like you know 10 o'clock midnight something like that and I replied I said well I thought you were pretty busy on uh, on the Alan Moore books at, at Awesome and he told me that Awesome had told him to stop working and that the books were no longer being produced and uh, at that point, I called him, <laughs> <laughs> and we um, we had a chat, and he told me that uh, apparently Awesome had decided to close up shop, and then I um, I got off the phone with him, and it was at that point probably like midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and I knew I had to just you know, call up Alan. But at that particular time, when I was in New York, it was a five hour time difference. So I had to wait until five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember, um, I actually went out to a pay phone because I didn't want to pay. I didn't want to pay. I didn't want Jim Lee to have to pay hotel phone rates. So <laughs> I went out to um, a pay phone at five in the morning and in Manhattan. And I, um, I put it on my company card, the phone call and I called up Alan and I, I said, uh, hi, Alan, it's Scott Doonbeer. I just, you know, I wanted to call and see if you wanted any work. And he said, Oh, thank you, Scott. I'm very happy, you know, working on my books at awesome. And so I, uh, I appreciate it as always, cause we, we had spoken before. And uh, I and I, I I remember saying, you haven't heard. <laughs> <laughs> and he had not. And so I said, um, um, you know, 
I got a call from Brandon and the, uh, apparently the line is, is shut down. Um, and he was concerned and he said, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I told him it, it was, you know, two in the morning in California and he probably shouldn't call up at that point. Um, so we agreed that, um, he would, uh, well, he told me he would call and he asked me to call him back in several hours. And so I did. I called him back and he uh, he said uh, that um, it had been confirmed to him that they had shut down the line. And I said, Alan, if you want to do a book or multiple books at Wildstorm, I can tell you that we would love to have you do stuff. And he said, OK, um, I have a lot to think about. Let me let me get back to you. I'll reach out to you in the next couple of weeks. And I said, okay, at at your convenience. And one week later, the Wildstorm fax machine started shooting out pages, and there was a 10-page document single spaced anyone who's ever seen alan moore scripts knows what it looked like <laughs> yeah and he um he sent me the entire abc proposal and now at that point i was not involved in bringing that book to uh to wildstorm uh that was i believe mike heisler who was the uh editor-in-chief before me mm -hmm. um but I wound up becoming the editor on that book too. I edited all the ABC books, but so, um, you know, he sent the proposal and it was pretty much mostly pretty formed. There's a lot of stuff that he sent that never happened. Um, mm. but you know, he wanted to do a series called, I think it was called the Pearl with, uh, uh, John Toddleden, uh, which was sort of an underwater character, I believe. I have the proposal in my closet so I can go and look at it later. <laughs> um, and um, and then it grew from there. You know, we wound up doing uh, a total of five books, including League, uh, for a number of years. And it was, you know, truly one of the highlights of my career. Yeah. And I take great pride that I think, I'm not positive about this, I think I've actually edited more Alan Moore scripts than anybody else, including Karen Berger. Sorry, yeah. Karen. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and, and, you know, in all fairness, you know, it, it's very, you know, editing Alan Moore is, uh, you know, sort of like editing a Ferrari, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it is what it is and it's usually great. Um, and, you know, I, I, he valued my input and, you know, we would talk, you know, a lot, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine in the days before cell phones, what that phone bill was. <laughs> I'm sure my pal, John Neat, uh, uh, who was the president of Wildstorm, uh, would, uh, I'm sure know the numbers by heart and, uh, <laughs> and uh, be happy to share them with you. Um, but it was, um, you know, it was an, an amazing experience, you know, talking to Alan Moore for, several hours every week for years was great and he was uh, a wonderful person to work with and you know it was uh it was a hell of a time you know I, i've actually compared wildstorm in that period um before really be well even after dc bought us uh it was uh, to me camelot you know one brief shining moment right i was wondering what the circumstances were that made you that put you in the position of editor in chief at Wildstorm in the first place. You mean how I went to Wildstorm, or yeah, like how you how it's all how you all started out at Wildstorm in the first place, like how that all began. So um, uh, Jim Lee is a good friend of mine, and we've known each other since the, you know, probably 1987 was the first time we met. I I, I think we met at WonderCon, and um, we were always friends. You know, we we sort of bonded over art and gambling and we um when he would come to town we would like hang out you know and play pool and you know do this and that um talk art he used to send me faxes of uh, artists that he you know once he started wildstorm he would send me faxes and 
uh, I remember one time he sent me faxes of this one guy and he was like really hyped up on him. And, you know, I remember looking at it, just shaking my head, you know, and I called him up and I said, Jim, I just do not see, I just, I just do not know what you see in this guy. You know, it's, it's definitely not, um, you know, he's a flash in the pan. And, uh, um, so that was uh, J. Scott Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say, you know, I was the editor on uh, Gen 13 for a while after Sarah Becker left. Uh, she went off to do uh, a reality TV show called uh, Miami, uh, Real World Miami. Ah, okay. Uh, um, and, and she's one of the people that really helped me become an editor. She was very kind uh, with sharing her knowledge. Cause I, you know, I was sort of thrown in on the, into the deep end when I started editing. Um, and I can tell you that Sarah Becker is one of the best people I know. Um, but that's not the question. Is it? So, <laughs> so Jim and I were friends and he, and I would talk and, you know, he, uh, um, I think in 1992, he offered me a job and I said, you know, well, what would I do? And he said, ah, we'll figure it out. And <laughs> so I, I, I respectfully declined. And then uh, in 1993, he said, you know, the same thing. And um, so finally in, maybe it was 19, I can't remember when, I, I remember turning him down three times. So I don't remember the timeline exactly, but then at, um, at Comic-Con, in 1994, uh, I was at um, I was at San Diego, and I got a phone call from uh, from Jim, and he um, actually no, that's not right. That's not right. What what happened first was uh, I was an art dealer, and I I was repping a young artist that I thought was somebody who really had a lot of potential, and I showed his work to Jim. And Jim, Jim said, okay, call him up and I want to fly both of you guys out to San Diego. That was probably in 1993 or two. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Maybe 1993. And, um, uh, and that was Travis Sheree. And so we flew out to, we met at the airport. You know, we both arrived at the same time. Jim picked us up and he took us out to lunch and we, in La Jolla, and he was the offices were in a different uh, place at the time. They were in San Diego, but they weren't in the offices in La Jolla. And mm -hmm. so we were at the Hard Rock Cafe, and you know, Jim's like, "Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about maybe getting offices here in La Jolla. You know, it's such a nice place. You know, there's the ocean, and you know, this and that." And so, across the street from the from the Hard Rock Cafe was this place called the La Jolla Bank Building at 888 Prospect Street. And so <clears throat> we, we were walking back to uh, his car and he says, you know, like maybe this place, you know, like, you know, this, this place looks pretty good. And, and so we actually walked in and took the elevator up to the second floor and it was just sort of an open space, you know, it hadn't been built out yet. And we were literally walking through what it would eventually become the Wildstorm offices. <laughs> and so Jim said, like, maybe this place. And so, um, <laughs> and then, um, um, and then of course he wound up, he wound up uh, um, doing those offices and we were there for years and it was a great, great place. My office actually was the corner office and I had a view of the ocean over here and prospect street over here you know it was crazy that's awesome um, and so um but getting back to 1994 so i get a phone call from jim at like you know 10 30 at night or something and he's saying um you know hey come on over I'm, i have a poker game come on over and i'm like jim you know the, it was the day that the show was starting at you know nine in the morning 9 30 right. next day and i'm tired you know we set up the set up the space and wound up uh um going back to the hotel and me and me and my friend Stephen Callahare who was uh, working for me <clears throat> and um so Jim said no come on out come on out 
And I'm like, Jim, I'm tired. I'm tired. And he goes, no, come on out. You got to come out. We got to, you know, I have a poker game. It'll be fun. You know, I got a bunch of guys here from the studio. Da, da, da. I'm like, Jim, let's do it tomorrow. And he says, all right, bring your art. And I guarantee I'll buy $10,000 worth of art. <laughs> oh, you drive a hard market, Jim. <laughs> Say, okay, all right. So we drove out to... Uh, to his house and he at that point he was living in la jolla in this amazing house years later uh years later uh i actually got married at his house um um and uh jim was uh jim was my best man um, but what happened was i um i went out and he picked out a bunch of art we played cards and then I don't remember. I don't think it was that night. It might have been that night because he lived very close to the studio. It was either that night or sometime in the next day or two when we went to the office. I think it was actually that night, insane as that sounds. We actually went to the offices, the studio. It was Homage Studios. And we were walking through the empty hallways and he was just saying, this could be your office. This could be your office. This could be your office. And I said again, you know, what would I do? And this time he had an idea what I would do. And so I, um, I said, okay, I would come out. You know, I, I was at that point, I was starting to get a little bit bored with art sales because it was just, you know, I had done it a long time. It was a little bit easy for me and there wasn't really much of a challenge anymore. You know, I'll always love the time I did. You know, I got to travel the world. You know, I mean, I went to shows. I went to f shows in France, in England, in Germany, um, Italy, just um, amazing places. I went to shows in uh, Japan and uh, it was great. You know, I would travel all over and uh, that was the real perk and drive for me. But, you know, as much as I love traveling you know how many times can you go to Luca in Italy and you know it, I'll never get bored going to Italy but I'll get bored going to the same show year after year after year you know I mean Italy will never get boring to me I'm actually going to the uh, Lake Como comic art festival in uh, in May and I'm thrilled to be doing that because the Lake Como Comic Art Festival um, is just insane. I've never been there. I've been to Lake Como when I was a, in, when I was eighteen, and I was URLing around. But the Lake Como Comic Art Festival, you know, nothing against shows in Luca or in Angoulême or even San Diego Comic Con, but those are just giant, massive phenomenons whereas this show from all everything i've heard it's going to be a show that's different you know they actually they actually have usually 800 fans that go and i think they cap it at a thousand people you can't you know it's very limited and apparently you can uh apparently you can um i sound like a shill for the place <laughs> apparently you can um have an have an interaction with an artist they they apparently they set up chairs like a single chair in front of you know Mila, Mila Manara or Bill Sienkiewicz so people can actually sit down as they're drawing and talk to them on a personal yeah. level and it's you know right on Lake Como which is you know famous for I think two things and that is you know George Clooney you know used to live there and it also had it was part of part of the uh um, early Star Wars movies were actually filmed there. You know, the ones episode, you know, two and three or whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, it, it's almost a magical place. But anyway, enough about Lake Como. I'm going. <laughs> You're you know, going in May. It's going to be great. You know, I, I'm get and I'm get, I'm going to get to see some old friends of mine, like John, uh, John Meter Jr. is going to be there. And uh, Lee Bermejo, who uh, is an old, old friend who I actually, you know, sort of discovered. Uh, yeah. 
but um, and he's a great guy and a great artist. But anyway, lots of people. They're going to be just like more than a hundred, just amazing artists. Some of whom I don't even know their work, but I'm excited to meet them. But anyway, yeah. what was I talking about? I've completely <laughs> forgot about it. You're talking about becoming a senior editor at oh. Wildstorm. Yeah. So so what happened was the way it happened was uh, Jim had this idea, and I would come out and you know maybe sell art for the artists there at the studio and. He bought a uh, an iris printer, which is now known as a G clay printer, and I would do fine art prints. Um, and I did some really nice prints, you know, one with Bruce Tim of Marvel Girls, uh, one with Mike Mignola, this amazing painting of Hellboy fighting a monster, uh, and then um, there were others like classic covers. We did uh, the cover to Green Lantern. Uh, number 85, which is the My Ward is a Junkie cover. And these were all signed and numbered. You know, they were signed and numbered by the artists. So Neil Adams, Bruce, Tim, all these guys. Yeah. And, you know, it was it was fun. But I remember, I remember, you know, over the, uh, oh, and I also arranged European tours, which was a lot of fun because I got to go on them. But, <laughs> um, but I remember... I remember I would complain to Jim about the uh, about the artists who were there at the studio, and let me you know, and let me preface this by saying there were a lot of really young, really really good artists who, you know who are still working today. You know, like Ryan Benjamin, you know, and Tom McWeeny, and Jeff Campbell, and you know, just just wonderful, wonderful people. You know, there was a guy named Nick Manabat who sadly passed away, who was a very unique talent. Um, and, and the studio was amazing because you also had all these guys working in house, you know, like Scott Williams and I became very close friends. We knew each other, but we became close friends because he had an office there and, you know, he would either come into my office or usually I go into his office cause he had a really comfortable couch. <laughs> and, um, um, and we would talk for, you know, about art and we would talk about, you know, anything. Um, but, um, you know, eventually, you know, I, I, I started complaining, I think, good naturedly to Jim. And I would say, you know, Jim, you got to diversify. You know, you got to find different talent. You know, you can't just have the same, you know, you can't. I mean, nothing against people like Chris Claremont, but, you know, you've worked with Chris Claremont. You know, you've you've worked with these people and, you know, the artists that you're picking they basically, a lot of them just look like you. Right. And I said, you know, Wildstorm has Jim Lee. We don't need another Jim Lee. We need other people. And so I think he just got sick of me saying that. So he just said, okay, smart guy. And he actually did say that. He said, okay, smart guy, you know so much, you edit a book. And so uh, the first book I ever edited was um, something that Jim picked out, although I wound up... Uh, picking the creative team on it mostly. Uh, it was a Gen 13 Max crossover that uh, was by uh, uh, Bill Loeb's and uh, Tom Coker. And Tom, um, you know, I, I, I met him at Comic-Con that year in 1995 and he showed me his samples. And, you know, there was already another artist who wanted to, who I wanted to do it. But we couldn't we couldn't agree on the uh, page rate. It was just you know it would have been too great a page rate to do. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so Tom uh, Tom did it, and uh, um, I had no idea what I was doing. And that particular book is the book where uh, Sarah Becker saved my ass. <clears throat> and then um, my second book was called Gen Thirteen Ordinary Heroes, which was written and drawn by the great Adam Hughes, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of that book. And Adam, you know, Adam obviously is one of the best artists working in comics as far as I'm concerned. Um, but he's not just a great cover artist, which, you know, obviously is known mainly for covers because he doesn't draw that much interiors. But he is, he and Jeff Campbell, J. Scott Campbell are very similar. Um, they're known for their covers, but yeah. both of them are tremendous storytellers you know adam uh, you know adam is a brilliant storyteller he's a great writer jeff isn't a great writer he's okay you know but sorry jeff 
but <laughs> but Jeff is, you know, people really, you know, sort of people dismiss Jeff Campbell's work. And I always, if they do, if anybody, if anybody does that in front of me, I always say, look, you got to look at his work because he is a great storyteller. Yeah. And, you know, do you have any idea who his first big influence was as a, as a comic artist? Oh man. Uh, Arthur Adams, uh, maybe John Armita. I'm not sure. Mort Drucker. Oh, Mort Drucker's mad. And, you know, if you look at his early work, you can see that, you know, he's great at doing caricatures and he's just, you know, he's such a talented guy, you know, and, and he's a smart artist. He really uh, knows how to market himself and he knows how to draw and he's a, you know, really good guy. And he's again, you know, one of my best friends. Um, so, <clears throat> and obviously he's a, he's a fan of Art Adams and he became, a big Art Adams fan uh, later, but Mort Drucker was his first influence. And, uh, you know, if you look at his work from, you know, the first Gen 13 miniseries to Danger Girl, you'll see a tremendous growth as an artist, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, um, and, you know, and he's, he's, he's an artist like all good artists who evolve into something different and, uh, and better. So, yeah, no, I I remember uh, growing up on uh, Campbell's Gen Thirteen series and know, knowing him as an interior sequential artist mm -hmm. uh, by and large. And then uh, I remember him branching out and doing a lot of like you know those big uh, Spider Man Marvel covers uh, when uh, sure. JMS took over. And I was like, hey, that's awesome! Uh, I can't wait to see him on a series. You know, I can't wait to see him actually do some interior. And it just never really materialized. And I was like, I was always I always lament that because he was such a good. And I assume still is because I remember uh, the the most recent thing I think I've seen of his sequentials is he did like a revisit of Gen thirteen for that uh, that DC uh, Gen thirteen Wildstorm thirtieth anniversary book, sure, uh, which was cool. You know, it, the the problem is, you know, if you're doing a cover, you can you're doing a single image, but if you're doing sequentials, you're doing six images, five exactly, images. and and it may seem <clears throat> it may seem like it's not a stretch because it's smaller, but it's actually more difficult because you have to figure out the pacing. Um, you have to figure out where the story is going to go. You know, I mean, storytelling, you know, comics are a sequential storytelling medium. I mean, it's basically film on paper. Yeah. And, and, you know, you have some really shitty directors out there who <laughs> don't know how to tell a story. And you, then you have some brilliant storytellers, you know, I mean, like, you know, it's funny. I um, I don't remember the guy's name because I I'm lame. I usually I know old movies, but the guy who did the new Indiana Jones movie. Um, oh yeah, um, who did uh, Logan and um... yeah 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 right right yeah he I you know, you know it's an okay movie. It's not the greatest movie in the world. It's certainly better than the last Indiana Jones movie. Yes, but I was kind of shocked when I watched that to see how good a storyteller he was and, you know, and Jeff's Jeff's main influences, you know, they're more drunker guys, but his really, his big influence since then, um, you know, art Adam, sure. Of course, Jim, sure. Or is animation, Disney animation. Right. You know? I mean, so, you know, and, and of course that's all about storytelling. Yep. Um, but anyway, um, so you were asking, <laughs> <laughs> I never met a tangent. I didn't like, um, so you're asking about, uh, how I started as an editor. So those are my first two books. And then I became special projects editor. My original title was going to be editor of cool projects, um, <laughs> except a couple of people said, oh, well, so my I, projects aren't cool. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I, I, I got it. You know, So I was like, okay, sorry. Um, um, I try to think more about other people's feelings now. <laughs> I was young. Um, but uh, so I became editor of special projects. Uh, I did a book called Gen 13 Bootleg. Um, and then about a, maybe a year later, sometime in 1996, somehow, some way, Jim called me into his office and said, I've decided to make you editor in chief. 
And, you know, my reaction was, are you kidding me? Why? (laughs) (laughs) He, um, I was like, great. I mean, it came as a real surprise to me. And uh, um, I was editor in chief um, for a while. And then uh, when DC bought us, I became group editor and I eventually became executive editor, which uh, there were two other executive editor, three other executive editors, uh, Mike Carlin uh, of the DCU, uh, Karen Berger of uh, Vertigo. And uh, I guess, I guess there were three of us. So it was just yeah. the three of us. And then, um, and then I got to have a lot of fun. I got to, you know, I mean, there was cliffhanger, Um, which Jim negotiated that whole deal with all those artists. And it was great working with guys like Jeff, but also Joe Mad, uh, Umberto Ramos, later Chris Pacello. Um, But uh, like, you know, Umberto is just incredibly, I mean, all of them are really talented artists. I wanted to know about the origins of, um, as as we can transition to DC a little bit, um, the absolute edition, like the concept thereof. Uh, bridging your uh, your history of art collection and your respect for the medium and its presentation with uh, just physically where you were at the time and what uh, what projects you were working with, um, can you tell us a little bit about like the formation of that? Sure, sure. It's um, I have a, a fairly clear memory of it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, like like all of these things, it's a, it's a format. You know, it's sure. not. It's, it's not, I mean, people like, you know, talk about absolute editions reverentially and I appreciate that and I'm very proud of them. Um, it started as, it, you know, basically we copied uh, a French book because we had done some foreign licensing on uh, X-Men Wildcats and we got the Travis Charest X-Men Wildcats book and it was a french publication on real nice paper and hardcover format oversized and i remember i was talking to my good pal john layman and you know we were both like holy shit you know we should do stuff like this and yeah. and um i uh, you know i think john actually is the one that came up with the uh with the the title absolute although i think originally that was sort of cribbed from jeff campbell <laughs> in uh, a danger girl ad that we ran that said absolute danger girl i think like the absolute ads for uh for vodka yeah. yeah yeah exactly and so i think we might have been inspired by that but i can't remember i can't remember um but it was a, you know it was a, an off-the-cuff uh title that really you know was cool and um you know so, some of the people at uh, dc were like Eh, but what does it mean? You know, maybe we should, you know, (laughs) you know, okay. You know, but, um, so, um, uh, then, you know, the first book I, you know, I don't remember how many absolutes I did. I did absolute authority. I did, I did all the absolutes though myself. Cause I, you know, just had a vision. Well, I had opinions about what uh, it would look like. Yeah. Uh, You know, for instance, I think the first one was, um, authority uh with warren ellis and brian hitch you know which was you know what a great series that was um i uh i didn't edit that series that was edited by uh rochelle brisenden um and um but i i wound up buying it from warren because it was it was kind of funny um um warren and i have known each other a long time and Warren's a really good writer, and I think that his best work has been at Wildstorm. Um, I think the best thing he's ever written was Planetary. Um, and, uh, you know, because Warren's a great writer, doesn't always have the perfect ending. You know, he's a great yeah. writer, but Planetary is just perfect. And so I'll, I'll tell you two funny Warren Ellis stories <clears throat> on... Um, uh, the way, and Warren dis- Warren remembers this differently, but that's okay. <laughs> He's wrong. Um, when um, we decide, well, Warren told me he was going to be leaving Stormwatch, and you know he just decided he was done. He was going to change. He was going to leave it. 
and then um, it wound up it wound up um, so I had this idea and Warren says it was his idea it wasn't it was my idea and uh, um, it, it honestly doesn't matter but because he's so adamant that it was his idea it makes me laugh yeah uh, I um, I I had, we were going to be doing a Wildcats X-Men, I'm sorry, <laughs> a Wildcats <laughs> Aliens crossover. And since we were getting rid of Stormwatch, I, I, you know, I said, Hey, Warren, let's make this a crossover that has real events, you know, or, or is re in real continuity. So um, let's kill Stormwatch. And, you know, and Jim was okay with it and Warren liked it. And so that's what we did. And uh, okay, now I'm going to tell you a story inside of a story. So uh, the original artist on that book was going to be Gil Kane, uh, and it was going to be inked by Kevin Nolan. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we were going to, you know, Warren, uh, rather Gil agreed to do the story. And he, uh, we needed to get, we were going to run an ad in wizard to promote the book and it have you heard the story no no but i just i just love hearing about like wizard using uh, being referenced colloquially i'm just like ah oh, yeah well of course I'm gonna run an ad well, wizard and so what happened was uh, i called up gill and i said okay we need to get this done in like the next five days you know just a, a pin up it we'll use it you know later um as a variant cover or something i said to him um you know, I said, first I said, okay, do you need any reference for, uh, for the Wildcats? He goes, yeah, yeah. Send me some reference for the Wildcats. So I said, okay. I said, do you need aliens reference? He goes, no, that I got that. I know. Sure. I go, okay. All right, cool. Um, and so he says, um, I say to him, okay, I'm going to send you the reference. Uh, you know, and I, I talked to him specifically about what the cover would be, uh, because, because it was a time crunch. I said to him, okay, here's what we do. It's going to be, let's use Zealot and have her sort of facing the camera, holding her sword, and behind her is a giant alien looming over her. And she's kind of like looking like this behind her, and she's looking determined, not afraid in any way. You know, and she's looking determined. And I said, because it takes place on the Stormwatch satellite, make sure that there's a porthole with the Earth showing. Yeah, you know, I was very specific. And he said, uh, he said, got it. You know, that's that all sounds great. I can do that. And um, he was supposed to send me a sketch of it, but he didn't. And so, he, but he and because it was so late, and Kevin Nolan was going to be, you know, the anchor. Yeah. It was FedEx to Kevin. And so um, Kevin gets it. And we need it, you know, like in three days, you know, and, yeah. and this is before this is before we were sending, you know, files via yep. email. Channel. No, no, no yeah, PDF. Yeah. yeah. You're just shipping so this. Stuff. We had to get we had to get the inks, you know, by in two days so we can then have it colored in house. I think I, I might be wrong. I think Laura Martin colored it. Um and so when um, um, the next day I, I call up Kevin and I said, okay, did you get the package? You know, did you get the FedEx package? And he goes, yeah, I got it. And I said, um, how does it look? And he goes, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And then he says, but I think I better fax it to you. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I walk over to the fax machine and, you know, sort of, around the building and um to the to the main uh, reception area and there's a fax coming through and it was beautiful i mean it looked ex it was exactly what we discussed there was zealot you know she was holding the sword mm -hmm. she you know the earth was in the in the um in the porthole the alien is like looming over her the only problem was that the alien was wearing a bubble helmet and holding a fucking ray gun and had a big <laughs> star on his chest. What? And so he just he didn't get what the aliens were. And Kevin, <laughs> and Kevin had the nerve to blame me 
and say, well, you should have told. I said, I asked him if he, you know, I told him it was a crossover. But anyway, to this day, <laughs> and Kevin's wrong too. I'm like, Kevin, you got to fix it. You got to fix it. And he goes, oh, I hate doing that. I No, I'm not going to do what I hate doing it. I say, I'll pay you double rate. Okay. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> and so, uh, um, you know, you can find it online. You know, what I was going to say, like, do you have now? Did you, uh, as an art dealer yourself, did you have? Did you go like, I got to get the copy of that, by the way? <laughs> and, and I made a photocopy when I came in. I, you know, I don't know where, <laughs> it is, but it's it's online. I posted something uh, several years ago um, about it, so it's on. It is online, but um, okay. um, so. Uh, so yeah, and so and, and and as it turned out, Gil wound up getting sick, so he didn't actually draw the series. It was drawn by uh, Chris Brass. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> and then later, uh, that sort of led into the Authority, which is sort of why I brought up the story because it, exactly uh, Warren Warren then reached out to me and he said that he wanted to um, he wanted to uh, uh, do something brand new, and he said it's called the Authority. And you know, I said, okay, sounds great. You know, and then that that's how we got the Authority yeah. um, with. <clears throat> with um planetary um it was this is like one of my favorite stories um and and this particular story has happened several times in my career <laughs> um i um i got the okay this goes back to um wildcats uh when we were going to do the relaunch of wildcats in 1997 uh, Jim had not before I was involved. I mean, Jim had made a deal with Scott Lebdell, who is uh, a writer he worked with and, and uh, was uh, friends with to write the relaunch of uh, the Wildcats. And so, you know, I was tasked with hiring an artist for it. Um, and so I, uh, and I was the editor on the on the book, um, and there was an artist who was working for Wildstorm at the time, uh, John Cassidy, and he was doing a book called Desperados with uh, uh, my pal Jeff Marriott, who was uh, not only the writer on that series but also the uh, the editor. Uh, well, he wasn't he wasn't the editor on that series because he was the writer, but he was an editor at um, uh, IDW. He was also uh, in charge of marketing for a while. He later became the first editor in chief at uh, IDW. Really good guy. And uh, he's also a good fiction writer. He writes uh, uh, a bunch of different novels, including a series of Western novels. Um, if you Google them, you'll find it. But the um, the thing is. I, you know, I was looking at Cassidy's work and, you know, you could see the evolution in his work where he would evolve from, you know, a good artist to a really good artist. And yeah. so <clears throat> I, um, I decided to hire him for Wildcats. And so I called him up and well, first I went down to see Jeff and tell and said to him, Jeff, I'm really sorry. I'm going to take your artist. <laughs> <laughs> I think of it. I, I don't think he's mad at me anymore. But um, <laughs> so, um, so I, um, and actually, what's really funny is his son, David Marriott, who I remember walking around in like, you know, pajamas at, in the Wildstrom offices, uh, was working until recently at IDW. And he's a great guy and a really talented editor and writer. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So <laughs> I, um, I called up John, you know, and I said to him, all right, I have this new, I said, I, I want to take you off a of Desperado and put you on something else. And he was intrigued. He's like, what, what? And at that time, I think he had already done like maybe another series for Marvel. Uh, um, I forgot what it was, you know, but he, um, he was intrigued and I said, okay, we're doing a relaunch on Wildcats with Scott Lebdell, and I want you to draw it. And he was like floored. He's like, oh, my God. Yes, because, you know, he's a young artist, and he's seeing this as, you know, a major a major thing. And, you know, he's excited. You know, he's going he's gonna to be doing, you know, the flagship Wildstorm title. 
And so <clears throat> then something unexpected happened. The only time Jim Lee ever overruled a decision of mine was on John Cassidy drawing Wildcats. <clears throat> and so Jim said, look, we just need, we need a big name, you know, to make this work, we need a big name. And I said, oh crap, I, I've already given it to him. He goes, well, you got to tell him that he's not doing it. And so, and then, you know, Jim had decided that Travis was going to draw it and, you know, it looked beautiful. It didn't quite come out as frequently. I was going to say, it's going to take a little while. <laughs> but, you know, um, but, you know, Travis is a brilliant artist and, um, you know, we, we used to bend over backwards for him because he was so goddamn good. You know, we yeah. used to say, <clears throat> it used to be kind of funny when, when Travis would be drawing stuff and when he, when he was doing Wildcats X-Men, he, and, and pa when pages started coming in, well, he was actually at the studio, what, but when he was doing pages in Wildcats X-Men, we would look at the pages and, you know, me and Scott Williams, especially, we would look at them and Tom McWeeny too. We would look at them. You know, like when Travis was gone for the day and, you know, we'd go into his office and, you know, and on his drawing board would be some art and we'd be like, holy shit, he made another leap, you know, yeah. I mean, because you could literally see the progression of his crazy, insane talent on a daily bait. Well, maybe not daily, but on a page by page basis. Right. And then when he started doing those, um, that series of eight covers for okay. uh, Wildcats, you know, the Wetworks one, the Devon, um, um, I forgot Jim's character's name, the uh, Divine Right one. Yes. Uh, the, you know, they were all like, everyone was getting better and better and better. So, you know, just Travis is one of those guys that, you know, just blows me away. I mean, that new series, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that new single issue he did with uh, Mark, um, I forgot what it was called, but, you know, just gorgeous, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, getting back to John Cassidy. So, I called up John and I said, John, I'm really sorry, but Jim overruled me. He said that we can't use you on the book. He needs a bigger artist. And, you know, he was quite frankly devastated. Yeah. You know, and I remember, I remember telling him, you know, how sorry I was. And he was really nice about it. John's a super nice guy. And he said, um, no, I, I understand. Yeah, I'll, I'll get over it. And then I said to him, but I do have a suggestion. I have some, I think good news because that day, crazy fate, I got the proposal for planetary. Ah. And so I said, but I just got a proposal this morning and I read it. And John, honestly, you would be perfect for this book. I cannot think of somebody who's better for this book. And, you know, it's almost along the lines of who could be better than Kevin O'Neill for League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You know, right. I mean, it may not be the obvious choice at first, but, you know, you know, how can you argue with it? Exactly. Um, so with, um, with John, you know, he was like, okay, send it. <laughs> and so I faxed it to him 10 minutes later. And a half, half an hour later, he called me up and it was a different John. He was like, oh, my God, I have to do this book. I have to, you know, this is the greatest thing, you know, blah, 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 yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah, And I'm like, okay. And so that's how we got, uh, that's how we did Planetary. Planetary, that's and awesome. Did, yeah. And so, um, and I was the editor on uh, on some of it. I don't remember how much I edited. And then it, I turned it over to John Lehman. Um uh, I know I edited the very first planetary story, the eight page preview. I'm not sure if I edited anything after that. And then I edited like the last eight issues, um, which were just so much fun for me because the stories were great. John's art was great. Laura Martin's coloring was great, you know? And as I said, you know, that ending was just as perfect a comic, you know, the, it, it's, you know, the last, the, the second to last issue wrapped everything up and then the last issue just finished up the series in such an epically great way yeah so i and i i really anybody who hasn't read planetary if you want to read a great comic read it by the absolute yes it's the way to read it there well two parts but you know two absolutes but it's worth it you know it's yeah. worth it. well the reason why 
one of the reasons why we're here today, uh, besides getting some dope stories about uh, some of our favorite books from uh, from <laughs> from at least my childhood, at least, uh, is the artist edition that is coming out for Batman Year One. Um, Wait, that's, that that's a thing, really? Believe it or not, uh, <laughs> you are integral to the process of getting us this artist edition of uh, of Batman Year One. Uh, these these <laughs> folks. I've got a chance to take a look at this. We're going to show you a couple of uh, JPEGs of it, uh, which of course will not do it justice. You have to go get it. Uh, but uh, this magic, I always get this wrong. Mazzucchelli? Mazzucchelli. But let me, let me just, let me just say one important thing. Please. <clears throat> so, and I can talk about this more if you like during the, when we, when we look at stuff. Yeah. Just be aware um, that these JPEGs are, the raw jpegs so you know i i basically converted all of the tiff file or the psd files into jpegs and um these pages you know they're very close to how the final book what will be like in the final book but it looks i mean i don't know if anyone's going to really notice it except for me and david but uh <laughs> it's it's a the, they look a lot different in the actual book. And when I say a lot different, again, most people won't even notice. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, anyway, I'll let you, I'll well, let you talk. I mean, oh, that's just, just, uh, just the fact that, um, you're getting a chance to see, you know, the, the original pencils, you're getting a chance to see, um, the pages, even just bigger is, <laughs> is, is a benefit, uh, overall, because for most of us, um our our view of year one is like you know just just the newsstand size and uh and this is which, just, is, which is how it was intended to be seen of it course was intended to be seen that way and and actually you know david has a very long introduction where he goes into great detail about that which is really worth reading but anyway go yeah ahead. oh that's just just that just that um th this is coming out we're really excited to see it and um and i was wondering if you would share a little bit about how that project all came together and uh and what will uh what we can come to expect from it. Sure. Um, it's kind of funny. It's a book that I've wanted to do for more than a decade. Sure. When um, um, we, uh, we did, um, we did a, another book with David uh, more than 10 years ago called David Mazzucchelli's Daredevil Born Again Artist yes. Edition, which was, uh, at the time, our most popular artist edition. You know, it was the one that um, broke all sales records on artist editions. And yeah. it's a great book. You know, it's considered to be one of the best Daredevil stories ever, which yep. you know, is, saying, is saying a lot when you have, you know, Frank Miller um, doing his run with Electra and then later doing um, um, the that wonderful daredevil series whose name i'm forgetting with um uh john Romita jr oh yes man without fear man without fear just brilliant you know john Romita jr inked by al williamson you know just a dream team yeah but um so i would call this you know certainly one of the best daredevil stories ever um and you know we did it and like like with all artist editions uh they are done with the uh um consent and knowledge uh, of the artist and the artist's family. Um, you know, there've been some sort of yeah, not nice rumors that said we don't pay royalties on these books. That's not true. We do um, on um, artist editions. Um, and so we, you know, we did this book and I, you know, I, I had some, I had a lot of input from David, uh, including getting scans from him um and same thing with the with the batman book i mean david you know david provided nearly every scan in the book um either he had it or he got it from uh people who had it and then there are a few that i sourced out myself with daredevil born again the um his involvement was minimal you know he gave me the scans. We talked about the covers. We talked about a bunch of different things. Um, my designer, whose name is Randy Dalk, uh, did a beautiful job on it. Uh, David was happy that there were some vellum overlays in it. And um, 
Um, I always love the fact that Randy, and this wasn't my idea, this was Randy's idea. Mm -hmm. If you look at the at the cover of that book on the bottom right, uh, it actually says Daredevil in Braille, which mm. is a great touch. Yeah. So we did that book, and I remember sending the PDF to David, and David's reaction was, this looks great. Yeah, thank you. This looks great. Okay. And he said some very nice things about it in public. Um, he did an interview where he was talking about a bunch of things, and he was talking about... Um, Hang on a second. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. No, it's all right. I guess cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, um, my computer was acting a little bit wonky. Yeah. But, yeah. <clears throat> so David, David had. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so David, David's reaction was, "This, uh, this is great. This looks perfect. You know, I have no comments. Just, you know." He did it. We did a signed and numbered version. We did a slipcase, and uh, and you know, of course, I immediately said to him that I wanted to do Batman Year One. Yeah. I also told him I wanted to do Rubber Blanket, which uh, David, if you're watching this, I still want to do Rubber Blanket. <laughs> um, so there was an issue because DC at that time, you know, we had done some artist editions over the years with them and then they stopped doing artist editions and there was also you know we were doing a certain leg of dc and another place bob chapman at graffiti was doing some really nice books like uh uh, uh dark knight he did the sam keith uh, batman book that i edited um and and good old sam sam's one of my best friends sam actually called me up and asked permission for for him to do it uh, <laughs> That's Sam. That's Sam. But uh, and then Ronan, especially Ronan. I think Ronan, um, you know, is one of the best artist editions that have you know ever come out. It's just a beautiful book. Um, and so, what was I talking about? Now I can't remember. Oh, Batman Year One. Okay, Batman Year One. So sorry. <laughs> so, um, David had always wanted to do Batman year one with me because, you know, I, I told him that I would do whatever it took to make him happy on it. Yeah. And when we finally got the rights to do it, you know, we, from DC, um, you know, I was over the moon and David was very happy also. And, you know, it was a long process. And then when we announced it at, um, I can't remember where we announced it. It might've been at San Diego um my no i think it was before that i can't remember but um i was at new york it was at new york comic con i think and so i'm at new york comic con and maybe we didn't announce it i'm just rambling now maybe we, maybe we hadn't announced it but i told a few people okay and one of the people i told was chip kid and chip kid is um you know people talk about legendary people Chip Kid is legendary and yeah. with good reason. I mean, you know, all I need to say is he's the designer. He's done a million things, but he's the designer of the Jurassic Park logo. Right. You know? And so as well as a million other things. And he, he loves comics. Um, and Chip actually asked me if he could design this book. And, you know, if we're talking about budgets on on books he is used to versus budgets for the artist editions you know it's it's not quite <laughs> not, not quite even steven yeah scales of justice you know sure um, but so um um and i and i said you know chip i would love that and um i think david would but of course i need to ask him first and so i called up david and he says absolutely you know i would love to have chip do it and so uh chip uh, and I talked about things. David and I worked on, we worked on a pagination for the book because it was much more complicated than the Daredevil book for a variety of reasons. And so we worked on the pagination and, um, and it took, you know, 
I want to say three weeks to finalize the pagination. Huh. Uh, David had done his own. Um, he did a PDF of his own idea of what the book should look like. And honestly, at least 90% of what he put in that PDF is the book, you know, what, wow. it, what we wound up doing. Um, you know, there are definitely uh, different things in it. Um, you know, Chip had an interesting idea about not making the pages white. You know, he wanted to make them black, uh, laying on black. And, um, you know, when you see the book, you'll see that some of it is with black, but some isn't. Some is actually a, a, a gray. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was David's idea. You know, Chip, but David, want, you know, David liked the idea of the black on the layouts because the book has every layout page too and oh. you you see the complete story you see the complete story in layout form um it's and it's <clears throat> it's accompanying each issue so you don't have you know all the pages followed by all the layouts it's actually interspersed nice. um, and it and it works really really well um so they, um, you know, they both did a tremendous job. And then uh, David at the, once the PDF was pretty much finalized, um, it then went over to me. And there's a guy at IDW named Nate, Nate Wittick. And not only is he a, a great designer and production guy, but he's a super nice guy. And Nate... Honestly, you know, you know, there were a lot of changes that David had that are, were very minor changes that I would have let go, you know, because it, it wouldn't have bothered me. But he had a very specific vision for this book. And he, he you know, and, and, you know, he's right, because the book is, you know, it's hard to pick one artist edition that I, I think is the best artist edition. This one's certainly in the running for it. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, the amount of love and care that everybody put into this is just, you know, crazy. Um, so when, uh, um, and Nate, you know, really is sort of the unsung hero of this book. You know, he, uh, he really is. Anyway, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> So we're getting this book, uh, and it's going to be incredible. It's, it's. I mean, you've already, you know, you, you've you've already tested to the fact that it's like second to none, and it's it's, it's up there in the running for the best, uh, one of the best artist editions out there. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that I'm looking forward to the most, is just getting a chance to to see, I don't know, just just the the level of detail that you lose when things are are shrunk down is just is just one of those things that I, I love to see, and it, it's the, the the raw like talent on the page is something that is uh you don't really understand until you see like the original or something approximating the original art uh which is uh is is difficult uh given you know uh, the, the the proliferation of original art and, and how uh you know the the access that people have to it um this is like getting the original pages like for for a lot of uh, people out there who are looking to buy it um do we that, have a that was, that was that was the original intent, you know, to get as yeah. close as possible, even mimicking the paper. But anyway, yeah, the, the and the paper thing is always cool. Like, um, there's a there's an absolute killing joke where they uh they, they did the um there's two different types of paper within that collection as well um to kind of mimic the experience because you have the both colors because I know that um uh, Boland wanted to recolor the book, which you know uh, it, it's his prerogative, but you get you get both versions, which I really appreciate. Um, but yeah, man. Uh, so, uh, what's the, what's the release date on this? Do we, uh, I believe it's August 13th. It was, uh, it was supposed to be July, but you know, I mean, you know, honestly, honestly, I didn't give a fuck because, <laughs> because well, as long as we get it, I mean, you know, it's like, well, to me, the most important thing isn't the release date. You know, yeah. I mean, that's important to the publisher. Of course, they have, course. you know, they they have cash flow. They have all these different issues. But to me, what's paramount is the beauty of the book and being the book that is, you know, either my vision or the artist's vision. And yeah. usually it's my vision. But in this case, you know, it really is David's vision. 
and yeah. I just came along for the ride. Yeah, with the uh, with 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 um with a with a special appearance by Chip Kid, which is really friggin' cool. Yeah. Uh, I only have about a thousand more questions I want to ask you, but uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but Scott, if you're if you're amenable, I'd love to have you back on the show to talk more because um, I really wanted to talk about Sam Keith and the Max, but we'll we'll save that for another day because because uh, you know what? I'm sorry, I talk too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, like everything we got is great. I'm just uh, I'm just saying, like, oh, you brought you brought up uh, this, that, and the other thing, and I'm like, ah, that that too. But um, but for now, uh, folks, if you haven't already, you should check out Year One. Uh, in its in, in this version there's actually it's funny uh there's a lot of conjecture about releases for year one you know like i know that uh mazza uh mazza kelly, mazza kelly, mazza kelly. De devin mazza kelly has a like a favorite version so far of like collected or re reprinted editions of that or at least that's the that's the conjecture the rumor is that like oh don't get this version don't get this hardcover get this hardcover i think now we can say like yeah just get this <laughs> again you know again you know, thank you for that. And oh, sure. I think that, and this, and this, I think, will probably be my favorite version. But, you know, the the one thing that's not in this version is Richmond Lewis's coloring, which yeah. is phenomenal. And actually, you know, David goes into great detail in in his new introduction, talking about uh, the impact that. Richmond made and how, you know, he starts off saying in his first line of the introduction is this is the book you were never meant to see, which is because it was supposed to be in color. It was always intended to be in color. So some people were kind of like, you know, when, when, when I got the intro and I sent it in for approval, people were questioning that. And I, you know, I explained it to them, you know, that it's a very clear distinction. It's not that it's not that, he had any problem with the black and white work. He's very proud of it. And he, I, you know, he loves it, but it was always intended to be in color. So right. this is the book you were never meant to see. <laughs> Love it. That's a good sell. Uh, well, Scott, thank you so much for being here, man. And uh, thank you for sharing your insight. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure. It was great meeting you. And uh, hopefully folks at home, uh, you got some, uh, you got some really great tales. You can update the Wikipedia's for uh, <laughs> as they go, um, because that alien story is not in the Wikipedia folks. Um, Which one? The alien, the, uh, oh. the Wildcats alien uh, uh, crossover. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, I'm not one of those. I, I don't, I don't update Wikipedia, so it's not going to be me, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know what? I'm a Luddite. I don't know how to do that anyway. So uh, <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm like two steps away from it, but uh, thanks a lot for watching everybody. We'll see you guys next time right here.